Hello there. Um, looking forward to getting to this conver our conversation today because uh, Paul says something in, in the last part of verse 22 and 23 in chapter 1 that uh, just causes me to my mind to go in a whole bunch of different directions. Let me read it to you. He says, he's talking about whether by, by life or death, uh, he knows that God will be exalted in him. And he says, and then he says, I do not know which to choose. <laughs> I do not know which to choose, life or death. Because he says, I am hard pressed from both directions. I have the desire to depart, in other words, to die and to go to heaven and be with Christ, for that is much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Now, you know, if you're like me, you're tempted to go, uh, is this just kind of God words that he's kind of speaking here because it's the right thing to say? Or did he really, really, really believe that this was true? Because let's be honest, uh, whenever you and I have a, a experience in our life that, you know, kind of life threatening, whether it's an, an auto accident or a close call of some kind or another, you know, our first thought is, wow, darn it, I almost died. I wish I could go to heaven. <laughs> in fact, you kind of step back being terrified at the moment. It's the reason why most of us don't aren't comfortable standing on tall ledges looking over the edge to see what's on the bottom. Uh, by the way, I freak my wife out in Israel. Every time we go to Mount Arbel, it has a 1,500 straight uh, drop off. And I just have this need to stand on the edge and look over for some reason. That's part of my, my pathology, I guess. But the bottom line is, the idea of actually plummeting to that is terrifying to think of. And so, you know, Paul, when he says this, I just really sit back and go, where's this come from? And I think the answer really is given to us in 2 Corinthians, in the 12th chapter, where Paul talks about, he kind of speaks about himself in the third person, which generally is a sign of mental disability, but <laughs> mental illness. But, uh, you know, whenever you hear a person talking about themselves in the third person, you know, something's not work, not, not going right in their head. But um, the bottom line is, I digress. But um, I, I start thinking about conversations I've had. But <laughs> but I think it, it's really interesting because he does it. He speaks of himself in the third person because he's trying to take the focus off of himself and the glory off of himself because he describes something was really quite profound in his life. Many scholars think that when Paul was stoned uh, on his second missionary journey, that or his first missionary journey, that he actually was stoned to death, and that he was, uh, he describes dying, being caught up into the third heaven, which was a Hebrewism to speak of being really in the presence of God. The first heaven is the atmosphere around the earth. The second heaven is the star and the moon and so forth. And the third heaven they call the dwelling place of God. Now. It's kind of imprecise because God occupies all levels. He's in, in the stratosphere, he's in the, he's in the space, and he's beyond that. So, but the whole point is that he says that he saw things that were impossible for a man to utter. In fact, in his letter to the Corinthians, in his first letter, he said that in heaven there are things that cannot be seen. In fact, it would be almost criminal to try to express them. The eye has not seen, the ear, ear has not heard. It's never entered into the heart, or we might say into the wildest imagination of man, what awaits him. Paul saw something on the other side of death that was so powerful and so transformational that any fear of dying had completely been dissipated. And you know, I've known people who have had what we call uh, life after death experiences, Christians, and they've described something very similar. I had one friend who just simply said to me, um, I, I had a hard time not wanting to take my life every time things got real difficult because I knew what was on the other side and I was not afraid of it. Now, I'm not saying that to encourage somebody to take their life because... Um, that would be wrong, just wrong. I don't have time to go into that, but that would be wrong, right? That's a tragedy that you bring upon your family and friends. But what I am saying is that the idea that death is this scary place is only applicable to people who do not know Jesus. And that's part of the thing that's so depressing to me when I hear, especially of a non-Christian who takes their life, uh, where have they ended up? What do they find when they come up on the other side? And, and the Bible seems that Jesus, in fact, 11 different times described a place that sounded very terrifying, outer darkness, gnashing and wailing and, 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 and just endless sorrow and grief. I can't imagine what it would be like to simply wake up into eternity and find that you're there 
alone, alone in, in total darkness with no dimension. And the only companionship you have is the demons that deceived you and tormented you and brought you into that end. It's, it's something that really quite literally is terrifying. And I think too many Christians don't take Jesus's words seriously. They may take them literally, but they don't take them seriously. And I think there's a difference, unfortunately, for many people. But the thing I think is really important to understand is that Paul said, I suddenly found myself in the presence of something that there's no human vocabulary to encapsulate what I saw. If, and I think maybe an example of that is when you read through the book of Revelation and you try to figure out what John is describing, I mean, I've seen people giving pictorial representations of what they've seen in heaven, you know, the beast, <laughs> the woman riding on a beast and all those kinds of things. And they're pretty gross, horrifying characters. And yet somehow I, I'm always left with a sense, I don't think it really grasps the true dimension. When John says, I saw this creature and I was both terrified and, awe, and awestruck at the same time. Uh, that's, a, that's an amazing thing to be so terrified and yet at the same time be so overwhelmed by the awesomeness of it. I, I don't know how anybody could sketch that out and really communicate that so that you and I would capture it. And that's the whole point. As Paul said, I saw something that left such a, a, a magnitude of impact upon my thinking that if I were to die in this very moment, it would be glory. It would, I would be rejoicing. I would be dancing. You know, as I, I do funerals, and, and for some reason in the last year, I think <clears throat> my guys told me that we used to do four to five funerals, you know, on average a year. Um, maybe it's just the age of our congregation. Last year, we did 12. This year, we've done eight already for the, just through the first couple of months. Um, and I, I'm still, a lot of people still trying to puzzle this out, why this is happening. A lot of people <clears throat> are dying a lot earlier than they used to. But the thing that really, really strikes me as I sit there and speak to the congregation, I, I look at the family, you know, and, and they're justifiably heartbroken and tragically saddened because here's somebody that was a central part of their life that's no longer there. And, and even though sometimes I, I talk about people being well-intentioned dragons, you know, people will come up and say, well, they're in a better place, and which is true. And uh, basically, your time will heal and, and you'll find somebody else. That's kind of the hardest one because you, you really don't. The reality is it's, it, you've lost something and that something you've lost is irreplaceable. Uh, that because every one of us is a unique version of ourself and there's not a copy anywhere else in the universe, uh, that is something Then, when that person is gone, we're not going to find another person who's going to fill that gap. That's why we mourn. And I tell people, you should mourn. You should weep. You should be sad because you've lost something that's irreplaceable. The wonderful thing we have as a, home, as a Christian is, but one day we will be reunited before the throne of God. And I have this kind of crazy concept that uh, because we're in eternity, we won't have a sense of the time gap that we experience right now. You know, it's right right now, if my, if, if my wife and I were, either one of us were to pass away, there would be this time that we would live without the other. And we are very aware of that gap right now in this world. But I believe that when we're before the presence of the Lord, that time gap disappears. And it's almost as if we had never been away from them and we will be with them as we are for all of eternity, rejoicing before the throne of God and thankful, just incredibly thankful to everything that God has bestowed upon us. I often tell people that when our loved ones enter into the presence of the Lord, that probably the first word, word out of their mouth is, all of this for me? <laughs> They're just blown away by the grace and the generosity of God. And I think that's what Paul understood. He had a kind of experience. He was so impacted by what he saw that he realized that God had given him a glimpse of heaven to give him the strength not to give up. Because in human terms, Paul, I think Jesus is the only other person who suffered more than Paul suffered in his physical life. And how many times he just would have thought, I'm just gonna lay down and die right here. How did God keep him going forward? He says, because I realize that God is leaving me here because it's necessary for your sake that I can continue on. But I'll stop here and we'll pick this up tomorrow. God bless you.